Murphy. Uh, yeah. I think it's quite an honor to have you amongst us despite your busy schedule, uh, especially today. Uh, so we cannot thank you enough uh, for taking our time and to speak with us. Um, just as a quick warm up uh, to our students who are joining and who have joined in, if you would allow us, we'd just like to start with your short bio, please. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Ankit. Thank you, Professor Murphy, for uh, uh, I would say a fascinating lecture that I, uh, we're all looking forward to. Uh, so, uh, which is basically on need and prospects for a UN Convention on Crimes Against Humanity. Uh, my name is Akriti Tripathi, and I'm prof assisting Dr. Popovsky, who is teaching us um, UN law and practice as well as international criminal law. And coincidentally, this is something that we have been uh, talking about or at least building up to uh, in terms of understanding uh, the relevance of um, what a UN Convention on Crimes Against Humanity can do for us in present day and age. Uh, to give us a very short introduction for Dr. Professor Murphy, um, he's the Manat Arn Professor for International Law at the George Yor Washington University in Washington, D.C., and um, uh, Professor Murphy has had been elected by the UN General Assembly to serve as a member of the UN International Law Commission for 2012 to 17, and then re-elected in November 2016 to serve until 2022. The International Law Commission has appointed him as a special rapporteur for crimes against humanity. From 1987 to 98, uh, Professor Murphy has served in the US Department of State Office of the Legal advisor working inter alia on matters relating to international humanitarian law, the law of the sea, and international dispute settlement. And uh, ever since entering academia, Professor Murphy has served as counsel, arbitrator, or ad hoc judge in interstate and investor state cases, including before the International Court of Justice, the Interna International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, and the International Criminal Court. Um, a former president of the American Society of International Law, Professor Murphy has published widely, including his treatise on principles of international law. In fact, if I could uh, be quick to mention uh, that uh, his article on international environmental liability has won the 1994 AJIL Deak Prize for Best Scholarship by a Younger Author. And um, his book, uh, Humanitarian Intervention, the United Nations in an Evolving World Order, won the 1997 ASIL Certificate for Preeminent Contribution to Creative Scholarship. So uh, one can only imagine that we have such an uh, industry speaking to us today. Uh, we're really looking forward. And thank you once again for taking our time to speak with us uh, today. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for that wonderful uh, introduction. I wish I could bottle it up and hear it every day. It's much appreciated. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to be here uh, with you uh, at the Jindal Global Law School. Um, I'm honored to be invited. And uh, although we have to do it in a virtual environment, in, in many ways, this pandemic has opened up new opportunities for us to interact. And I think that's uh, that's a very good thing. Um, so I thought I would speak for about 30 to 35 minutes about this issue of a potential new convention on the prevention and punishment of crimes against humanity. And I'll do this in basically four parts. Um, I'll uh, start with a little bit on the historical emergence of the uh, concept of crimes against humanity. I imagine many uh, participating in this are familiar with the current situation maybe, but a little less about the history. So I thought I would talk about that, um, then talk a bit about the fact that we do have crimes against humanity occurring in various parts of the world today. And I know that Myanmar is of great concern to those in India and around the world. So I'll say a little bit about that. Um, third, uh, and this will go to the heart of the lecture, I'll talk about the need to combat crimes against humanity uh, fully by strengthening national laws and national jurisdiction, as well as creating a structure for interstate cooperation on matters such as extradition and mutual legal assistance. Uh, and then fourth, I will talk about the International Law Commission's project, which we recently uh, completed, and it's now moving forward 
to uh, governments for their consideration. And so I'll close a little bit in saying uh, my thoughts about the prospects for this to actually become a convention that would be fully adopted and implemented. So let me begin by uh, noting the emergence of the concept of crimes against humanity over the past century. Um, the crux of the concept is to identify and stigmatize, prevent and punish heinous acts that are committed on such a scale that they're not just acts against one or a few persons, but they're against a civilian population as such. From its origins in the early part of the 20th century, this concept of crimes against humanity was considered as having two broad features. First, the nature of the crime is so heinous that it's viewed as an attack on the very quality of being a human. And second, the scale of such crimes is so heinous that they're an attack not just upon the immediate victims, but against all humanity, and hence the entire community of humankind has an interest in their prevention and punishment. Now, in the aftermath of World War I, thought was given as to whether there should be international prosecutions of the senior leaders of the defeated powers for heinous acts committed against their own populations. And so this idea of crimes against humanity, you know, first emerged at that time, but they were not included in um, the actual prosecutions that occurred in the aftermath of the First World War. Um, indeed, if you look at the Treaty of Versailles and you look at Articles 228 and 229, those provisions related solely to war crimes, not to crimes against humanity. Even so, the seeds were sown for such prosecutions at that time because of an idea that this might be done. And in the aftermath of World War II, crimes against humanity were placed within the jurisdiction of the international military tribunals established at both Nuremberg and Tokyo. The principles of international law recognized in the Nuremberg Charter were then affirmed in 1946 by the UN General Assembly, and they were codified by the UN International Law Commission in 1950. And then they were further developed by the commission in the 1954 Code of Offenses against the peace and security of mankind. So those steps firmly entrenched crimes against humanity in the pantheon of crimes of greatest international concern alongside genocide and war crimes. But while there were hopes in the 1950s for the establishment of a permanent international criminal court, as I'm sure you all know, those hopes were unfulfilled. They crashed into the shoals of the Cold War. And instead, the prosecutions of war crimes and crimes against humanity and genocide, if they were to occur in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, occurred at the national level, left to national jurisdictions. In that regard, there was a modest and not particularly well-known 1968 convention adopted, which called upon states to nationalize crimes against humanity and to set aside statutory limitations on the prosecutions of such crimes. And that convention ultimately attracted the adherence of 55 states. Yet many states did not adopt national laws on crimes against humanity, and only a very few moved forward with prosecutions when alleged offenders were identified. The prosecutions that typically come to mind are the Eichmann and Devjanjuk cases in Israel, the Menton case in the Netherlands, the Barbie and Tuvier cases 
in France and the Finta and Muyana Zeza cases in Canada. In some circumstances, the issue of crimes against humanity arose in the context of national proceedings other than prosecutions, such as in the context of immigration proceedings. Instead of focusing on national laws regarding such crimes, the end of the Cold War brought new hopes for the establishment of an international criminal court, which would have jurisdiction over crimes against humanity. And so, of course, in 1993, we have the UN Security Council establish the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And then in 1994, we have the Council establish the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, both of which did have within their jurisdiction crimes against humanity. And then finally, in 1998, governments adopted the Rome Statute establishing the International Criminal Court, which provides in Article 5.1 that crimes against humanity are within the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. The Rome Statute in Article 7.1 defines crimes against humanity as murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation, torture, sexual violence, and various other inhuman acts when committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack directed against any civilian population with knowledge of the attack. That's the basic definition that you find in the Rome Statute. If you look at Article 7, Paragraph 2, it further clarifies that such an attack means a course of conduct involving the multiple commission of acts referred to in paragraph one against any civilian population pursuant to or in furtherance of a state or organizational policy to commit such acts. Now, I imagine you're also aware that in addition to the <clears throat> jurisdiction of the ICTY and the ICTR and the ICC, crimes against humanity have also featured in the contemporary jurisdiction of the hybrid tribunals that contain a mixture of international and national law elements, such as the Special Court for Sierra Leone or the Extraordinary Chambers in the courts of Cambodia. So all told, this historical arc has led us to a place where several features of crimes against humanity can be identified. First of all, a crime of, against humanity is an international crime. It can be committed by an individual, whether or not the national law of the territory in which the act was committed criminalized the conduct. Further, the crime is directed against the civilian population, and hence it has a certain scale or systematic nature that generally extends beyond isolated incidents of violence or crimes committed purely for private purposes. The crime concerns the most heinous acts of violence and persecution known to humankind. The crime may be committed with part of an armed conflict, but that need not be the case. Crimes against humanity can occur in peacetime and the crime can be committed within the territory of a single state, or it can be committed across borders. And finally, the crime can be committed by a government, but it can also be committed by other actors, including rebel movements, militias, or terrorist organizations. Let me turn to the second part of my lecture, which is to talk a little bit about the Commission of Crimes Against Humanity in the world today. The development of that concept of crimes against humanity was an important intellectual achievement of the past century. 
and the development of international courts and tribunals, I would submit, has been an important institutional development. But sadly, the case is, it's the case that crimes against humanity continue to be uh, occurring today on a daily basis in various parts of the globe. I think with this audience, I don't need to run through all the places where those crimes are occurring because unfortunately you can read about them in the daily newspaper or online, but let's just touch on at least a few of them. Um, Sudan comes to mind. Uh, at the outset of this century, the atrocities in Sudan were very much front page news, perhaps less so today. But you had about 200,000 civilians die over the past two decades in Sudan. Those atrocities were to a certain extent displaced by atrocities occurring in Syria, which have occurred since about 2011. And by some estimates, more than 500,000 Syrian civilians have died in that conflict. And I would note that that's a country that has a much smaller population than either India or the United States. So we're talking about an enormous percentage of the population being affected. In that conflict, perhaps the most notorious incidents involved the use of chemical weapons against the civilian population. But the widespread attacks on civilians by various means is such that it's likely to take generations for that country to recover. Of course, it wasn't only the government involved in those deaths. We also had non-state actors, including most notably the Islamic State, also known as ISIS, ISIL, or Daesh, that also inflicted terrible harm upon civilians in both Syria and Iraq, including attacks on religious groups journalists, and others. But in most recent years, I think the front page stories have been about the Rohingya people in Myanmar who have been exposed to brutal violence by the Myanmar military and paramilitary units being forced to flee from their homes to the point of leaving the country entirely, particularly as the countries of Bangladesh in India well now. And I suppose I'll finish by also noting the horrible situation in North Korea, where more than 100,000 people are held in camps, subjected to deliberate starvation, executions, torture, rape, infanticide, and forced labor. Indeed, those camps resemble the horrors of the camps of totalitarian states established during the 20th century. And in that sense, it feels as though our past is repeating itself. I'll turn now to the third part of my talk, which is about the need to develop national laws and jurisdiction. Given the continued commission of crimes against humanity today on such a horrific scale, it's fair to ask the question, what more might be done to help prevent and punish them. While continued efforts to develop and strengthen international courts and international tribunals are certainly warranted, it would appear that much greater attention now should be paid to the harnessing of national laws and national institutions as a complement to international jurisdictions, so as to deny any refuge worldwide for alleged offenders, and in doing so, hopefully to deter such behavior. Under the influence of the Rum Statute, in recent years, several countries have adopted or amended national laws that criminalize crimes against humanity, as well as other crimes. Yet many states, both that are party to and are not party to the Rome Statute, have no such national law. For example, my country, the United States, 
is not a party to the Rome Statute. And we have no national law on crimes against humanity as such. We do in the United States have criminal statutes on torture, on war crimes, and on genocide. But these statutes do not criminalize all conduct that might amount to crimes against humanity. And some of the constituent acts of crimes against humanity, as defined in certain international texts, are not found in US national law. Various studies have attempted to analyze the existence of national laws worldwide on crimes against humanity, as well as the scope of existing laws, both in terms of substantive crimes and the circumstances where jurisdiction may be exercised over those crimes. Important elements to consider when assessing such laws are First, whether there exists a specific law on crimes against humanity, as opposed to ordinary criminal statutes on penalizing acts of violence or persecution. Secondly, if a specific law does exist on crimes against humanity, whether that law includes all the components encompassed in the most contemporary definition of the crime, which would be Article 7 of the Rome Statute. And third, if the specific national law existing on crimes against humanity only applies to acts that occur in that state's territory, or whether it also extends to the conduct by or against its nationals abroad, or even acts committed abroad by non-nationals against non-nationals. At my university in 2013, we embarked on a study of national laws worldwide, and we reached the following conclusions. First, we found that at best, 54% of UN member states, meaning 104 countries out of 193, have some form of national law relating to crimes against humanity. So only about half the world has a specific national law on crimes against humanity. Further, we found that at best, 66% of the Rome statute parties have some form of national law on crimes against humanity. In other words, simply by virtue of becoming a party to the Rome Statute, it has not resulted in 100% of the Rome Statute parties adopting national laws on crimes against humanity. The study at my law school also looked qualitatively at the statutes that did exist on crimes against humanity, and we reached certain conclusions about that as well. 12 of the states that had statutes um, were thought by earlier studies to have um, no, um, excuse me, the study found that only about 41% of the states actually possessed a law that was specific to crimes against humanity. In other words, the statute often said crimes against humanity, but within the statute, it was referring to war crimes. So even though there was a statute called crimes against humanity, it wasn't actually dealing with those crimes. Further, um, we found that of these statutes that purportedly address crimes against humanity, um, only about one third of them were using the text that appears in Article 7 of the Rome Statute. Many of the Crimes Against Humanity statutes have been adopted in the 1960s, 1970s. They were relatively old versions of what we now regard as Crimes Against Humanity. And then a final finding was, even if you had a statute on Crimes Against Humanity that was a robust statute covering all the elements of our contemporary definition, 
um, most countries only would apply that statute to crimes committed within their own territory or by their own nationals. Consequently, they were not in a position to prosecute under their national law an individual who had committed the crime somewhere else and harmed people that were not that country's nationals. Which means that at the end of the day, you have a relatively limited number of places in the world where individuals can be prosecuted for crimes against humanity unless they committed those crimes in that country's territory. The unevenness and the adoption of national laws relating to crimes against humanity has collateral consequences with respect to interstate cooperation that seeks to sanction those offenses. Existing bilateral and multilateral agreements on mutual legal assistance and on extradition typically require that the offense at issue be criminalized in the jurisdiction of both states, a concept that is sometimes referred to as double or dual criminality. In other words, if one state has a statute on crimes against humanity, but the other state doesn't, it is very difficult to move forward with an extradition or cooperation on mutual legal assistance. Furthermore, there's a lot of discrepancies among states that have statutes on crimes against humanity that also impedes that cooperation. The two statutes may not line up sufficiently to allow the cooperation to move forward. So the unevenness in national laws and the ability to exercise national jurisdiction is what led the International Law Commission to take up its project on crimes against humanity. And I turn to this now as my fourth and final part of the lecture. In 2012, I proposed that the International Law Commission take up the topic crimes against humanity, believing that this was a gap in the field of international criminal law and human rights law, where the commission might be of some assistance. And after extensive discussions, the commission in 2013 added the topic to its long-term work program, and then in 2014 added it to the active agenda. In the course of doing so, the commission appointed me as special rapporteur. And so I began producing a series of reports over various years, 2015, 2016, 2017, that proposed a series of draft articles for what could be a new convention on the prevention and punishment of crimes against humanity. Ultimately, in 2019, the commission completed the project consisting of a series of draft articles, 15 in total, and an annex, along with a preamble, which we packaged together with commentary and sent to the UN General Assembly with the recommendation that the Assembly proceed with either a diplomatic conference or with a negotiation within the United Nations itself for the purpose of adopting a convention on the prevention and punishment of crimes against humanity. I won't go through the various articles that appear in the uh, draft convention, but I do note a few of the most important elements. It does adopt a definition of crimes against humanity that largely replicates what appears in the Rome Statute. It calls upon states to adopt a national law that contains that definition. It addresses certain other aspects of what the national law should look like, such as an elimination of statutes of limitation. It has certain provisions on prevention of crimes against humanity, the thinking being that it's better to stop the crime from even occurring rather than only punish it after the fact. 
It also contains provisions on out to dairy, out to the car, eh? the concept that if an offender turns up in your territory, you should either submit the matter to prosecution or extradite to another country prepared to prosecute. And it has provisions on extradition and mutual legal assistance. In the event that there's a dispute between states about the interpretation or application of the convention, it provides for settlement of disputes at the International Court of Justice. If one ever thinks about why did Bosnia sue Serbia only for genocide in the context of the conflict in the former Yugoslavia, it's of course because there's a genocide convention. And likewise today, if one thinks about why did Gambia sue Myanmar with respect to only genocide, but not crimes against humanity, the answer is we have a genocide convention. If we had a crimes against humanity convention with this type of clause for ICJ dispute settlement, then we would be able to see cases at the ICJ relating to crimes against humanity. Having now sent the draft convention to the UN General Assembly, to a large extent, the International Law Commission is no longer involved in this process. It's up to the member states to decide whether to move forward with a diplomatic conference or otherwise to transform the draft convention into an actual convention. And here is where our pandemic has caused a bit of difficulties yet again. <clears throat> it's been very hard for the General Assembly to meet over this past fall and um, for the sixth committee, the legal committee, to meet for the purpose of discussing whether to move forward with the convention. That's not to say there haven't been meetings. There have been meetings. There's a lot of interest among states in the possibility of adopting this new convention, but there are also some states that are uh, reluctant or skeptical uh, about it. I would say that there's not been outright opposition yet voiced by any states, but there are concerns about whether now is the time to move forward with such a convention and whether it has the right kinds of elements within it that would be most useful for states in the future. So we're in a period now of states needing to decide whether to move forward. And I'm trying to do my best in talking to governments about the value in such a convention and why now is a time when it should uh, move forward. So let me just um, finish the, the lecture by saying that, of course, getting states to adopt the convention is an important next step, but ultimately not the only step. Uh, it then will require ratification by states and further will require implementation of the convention by states. So this will be a multi-year process, not something that's going to happen next month or even next year. And none of those steps are guaranteed. But I do think as an international community, we have to continue to strive to build a system of international law that stops atrocities from occurring using whatever lawful means are available to us. And I say this not just to experienced lawyers who I happen to, to meet, but I also say it often to students as well, because the ultimate success of this initiative will turn in large part on the commitment and hard work of the next generation of international lawyers. I think I'll leave it at that, but I certainly welcome any questions or comments that you may have. Uh, thank, uh, you so thank you so much, so much, much, much uh, Professor, Professor Murphy. Murphy. That was a very, was enlightening, a very enlightening conversation. conversation. Uh, we have Megha uh, inaugurating the round of questions. Uh, please go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you so much for being here. This was an incredible session. Um, I have a very hypothetical question for you, if you don't mind. So there are several claims that the COVID-19 pandemic and the virus itself is man-made. Now, what, what I'm about to ask is, is extremely hypothetical. In the event that this is proved, um, 
would this classify as a crime against humanity first and foremost and second of all in such an event do you believe that nations would reconsider the importance that we have to give to the convention and to the draft convention so i just wanted to understand that but again purely hypothetical thank you so much well thank you for the question it's a very interesting one and i suppose if we're running with the hypothetical the idea would be that it was intentionally created uh, by either a government or a non-state actor for the purpose of being unleashed on a civilian population um, as part of a sort of widespread attack against them. Um, the only part of the element of crimes against humanity that I would pause on is uh, the effects of COVID-19. It does cause death, and death is certainly one of the elements of crimes against humanity. Um, and so I think probably you would satisfy that that element. I was pausing just because obviously it doesn't necessarily cause death. It, uh, it uh, can make you sick, but you can recover from it. Um, it seems to me it should be uh, sufficient to qualify it as a crime against humanity. So I guess my answer to the hypothetical is yes. In the same way it would be to bacteriological weapons, um, biological weapons, chemical weapons, it's a comparable um, situation, right? You're un particularly in the context of biological weapons, you're unleashing a, uh, a virus um, that is designed or can kill. Um, so yes. Um, your other question though, uh, I think was, would it have the effect of encouraging states to adopt such a convention? And I think the answer is yes. Uh, I'll set aside now the COVID-19 uh, hypothetical, but I would say that when we have seen the adoption of major multilateral treaties, it is often in the wake of a particular incident occurring that galvanizes global attention and motivates governments to react. So, of course, the 1948 Genocide Convention is because of what happened during the period of the Holocaust during the Second World War. Um, or the adoption of the uh, conventions on early notification of nuclear accidents, that occurred right after Chernobyl uh, happened, too. So those sorts of things will generate um, the movement towards treaty making, and therefore, you know, were something like your hypothetical to occur, or were, you know, some other types of genocide, uh, sorry, crimes against humanity uh, appear um, on even a wider scale. Uh, yes, I, I hope that doesn't have to happen for us to get to this place, of course. I, I feel like we're living in a world where these crimes are already so prevalent that it, it should be readily apparent that the, the convention is needed, but um, there does seem to be a connection between uh, dramatic events and treaty making. Ankit? Uh... Yeah, um, well, thank you for your talk. So I have, uh, just to sort of sum up what you said, I think it, Again, is just to just to echo that it says that you need to have a you international law generally has this reactive approach, which is to say that you sort of wait for the moment and then you establish this international mechanism, which which essentially says that it must not be repeated. But uh, that's one point, uh, sort of a comment. And again, another one is uh, the with regards to the international law commission. In fact, we've got uh, Neela Oral, who's a member of the commission, who will be speaking on exactly this as, as to how the commission is going to work as a catalyst for development and uh, uh, will is acting as this medium to bring about a change and act as, act as a legislative arm of the United Nations. Although that does go beyond the mandate as to what it is attached with. Uh, besides that, I would also really like to read this report which you were uh, discussing. So if you could share that with 
with us, then that will be very, very helpful because then that will give some sort of a perspective as to how the Rome Statute is uh, is is perceived. I think, and uh, since India is again, it's not a member of the Rome Statute, then it, it does offer some sort of an understanding of the nuances as to the. uh statute and uh, that's that i just had these comments which i want to make and just thank you for your talk so uh, back to you well thank you ankit for those uh those remarks um yes it's interesting to think about the role of the international law commission as a catalyst uh for action um we tend to view ourselves as the legal think tank for the united nations so we're a bit of an incubator where ideas can be generated and studied over the course of many years and then produce a final product that we provide to governments in the hopes that it allows them to move forward in some fashion some of our projects um don't become treaties they just become uh instruments that are well thought of and and studied uh I'm sure you're familiar with the 2001 articles on state responsibility and and there are many other products like that 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 simply sit there and are what they are um by contrast occasionally we do do projects such as the crimes against humanity project which is intended to be a treaty um and if it doesn't become a treaty it will not be effective many countries for example will not extradite a person in the absence of an extradition treaty and so it doesn't do any good to just have a statement of uh you know uh, articles on the side that haven't been turned into a treaty it, it needs to be a treaty for it to truly function and that's the case for the crimes against humanity project um you noted that india is not a party to the rome statute and i noted that the united states is not a party to the rome statute the ilc's convention is designed for both states that are and are not parties to the rome statute so it uses the rome statute definition of crimes against humanity which is a good way of trying to harmonize national laws worldwide but it doesn't obligate you to join the rome statute so it's entirely possible for a country like india or the united states to adopt and ratify the ilc's convention on crimes against humanity and still stay outside of the rome statute um that's a different kind of choice whether you want to be a part of that international court or not but this convention would simply be calling upon say india to adopt a national law and to you know put around it the the necessary uh elements to allow that law to operate uh so for example um you know if there were uh members of the myanmar um military that had committed atrocities against rohingya people that at some future point turned up in india there would be an obligation to prosecute them for crimes against humanity or to extradite them to another country that was willing to prosecute them um so the idea is to try to put us in a position where worldwide we have these statutes and there would be no place of refuge for individuals who commit these crimes um obviously there are reasons why countries might not want to join a convention like this it it can create political problems right vis-a-vis -vis other countries uh if you're prosecuting their nationals um sometimes we would prefer to look the other way and not go after these types of offenders uh but i really think we're now in a world where we can't do that anymore that these types of atrocities are well known uh they're not something the public wants to tolerate um and they should be stigmatized and punished uh so my hope is that over time all countries will see their way towards adopting these national laws and coming into an uh, a convention relationship like this so that we can move forward with interstate cooperation 
just just to follow up to that i mean i see this linear tra- uh, trajectory uh, in relation to the draft articles on uh, state responsibilities and how impactful they are in terms of the current status quo that they are in so would you see that same level of uh, reverence if if this does not become a con- well i think that the um th- there's a lot of value in the uh, articles produced by the ILC on crimes against humanity, even before they become a convention. There's um, a lot of clarity in terms of the way the commission thinks about the operation of international criminal law in this area. And the commentary to the articles provides a lot of important background information on uh, prior case law and prior treaties that deal with international criminal concerns. But at the end of the day, it really is a project designed to be a treaty. Uh, It's not designed to codify customary international law. Um, If we were trying to codify customary international law, it might have a similar value as the 2001 Articles on State Responsibility. But that isn't what we were trying to do. And we're quite clear about that, that when we adopt a particular provision in a particular way, it's not because we think that's the existing law. It's because we think this would be a very good um, article to be in a a multilateral treaty. Um, When you think about other existing treaties like the Torture Convention, the Genocide Convention, um, the Enforced Disappearances Convention, maybe even the Convention Against Corruption, Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime. These are not treaties that are codifying customary international law. Uh, They're treaties that are putting states into a particular system of obligations where they must do specific things at specific times in specific ways. Um, And that's what this Convention on Crimes Against Humanity would be all about, too. So I wouldn't say there's no value uh, if it doesn't become a treaty, but it's really not designed to be a just standalone statement of rules that will somehow have a life of their own. Um, Murphy, if I could just... uh put out this observation to further the discussion, I couldn't help but notice that uh, Article 7 of the Rome Statute uh, in Clause 3 says that for the purpose of the statute, it is understood that the term gender refers to the two sexes, male and female, within the context of society. And the term gender does not indicate any meaning different from the above. So uh, keeping this in mind, does the Convention on Crimes Against Humanity address, um, you know, uh, let's say the LGBTQIA? Uh, Is it aware, is it inclusive of this, uh, you know, movement, these identities? And how does it, uh, you know, encompass or include the same? It's a very good question. Um, When I was talking about the... um, International Law Commission adopting the Rome Statute definition, I hope that I said uh, virtually or almost all or something along those lines because we did make some changes. And one change was we dropped that provision you just referred to. It does not appear in the final version. So the crime includes acts, you know, against persons based on gender, but it doesn't then define gender as being male, female. We eliminated that. It was our belief that it was inappropriate, um, that there might have been a view back in 1998 that there was a need for that kind of definition. Our feeling was that it's now 2019 when we adopted it, uh, 2021 today, that that's just inappropriate. Um, uh, And therefore it is welcoming of um, recognizing that these types of heinous acts could be committed against persons of all uh, types of beliefs about their gender and their 
their background and, and whatnot, such that um, uh, it's a much more you know open ended uh, definition. Um, there was some questions about that at the commission and and even among governments. Uh, some governments still like what appears in the REM statute, but um, I, I hope that you know. Uh, this is something that will not present any difficulty now for governments to accept. Thank you so much, Professor Murphy. I think uh, it's 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 very hopeful to see this progressive approach, even in such uh, at the international and global scale as well. Uh, uh, do we have time for one more question. Uh, I think Aparna, if you'd like to go ahead, please. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Akriti. Uh, good morning, Professor. I have. Two questions. Uh, my first question is that you're saying the COVID situation can be considered as crime against humanity, right? Uh, I I think it is. Uh, that's what I inferred from what you uh, you had spoken about it. And if it is uh, so, then to what extent China will be liable uh, for as it has caused a lot of economic loss, death. So, and uh, under what con which convention uh, would be applicable if China would be liable for the act? So, the hypothetical um, that you put to me was whether it was possible for uh, the intentional infliction of COVID to be a crime against humanity. So, you know, my answer was yes, it's hypothetically possible. Um, but you'd have to line up a number of things. So one thing you'd have to establish is that a government, you mentioned China, um, or a non-state actor intentionally, intentionally unleashed COVID-19 for the purpose of killing civilians. That's a pretty big if, right? that you would have to prove. So the mere fact that there was a release of a virus from say a laboratory that was either man-made or had jumped from say, you know, primates or something. Um, the mere fact that there's a release of the virus does not demonstrate an intentional attack on a civilian population. So you'd have to check off a, a few boxes there before you get to the point of being able to say a crime has been committed. Assuming that you could get there to demonstrate a crime, we're not talking about liability, at least not in the context I'm talking about. We're talking about criminal action, which means particular individuals could be prosecuted for the crime. So you would then have to ask yourself who exactly had the intent to attack the civilian population? Was it the director of the laboratory? Was it somebody above that director? You know, how high up in the government or in the non-state actor hierarchy does this go, right? And wherever it might take you, we're talking about prosecuting individuals, mm -hmm. not talking about holding anyone responsible for compensation, for example. And that seemed to be the drift of your, your question. If we were to set my project aside, right, and ignore the criminal side of this, then you could still be asking questions about responsibility. Yeah. And those questions don't necessarily turn on anything to do with intent or anything to do with crimes against humanity, right? So you can set up your hypothetical differently and say, forget about Murphy's crimes against humanity. I just want to know if a government actually was the entity that was um, that created this virus and that released the virus into the environment, maybe even unintentionally. Right? Maybe no intention at all. They're just playing around with a virus in a laboratory and it gets released. Yeah. Well, you can talk about that in the context of international law and state responsibility um, for just damage 
right, that causes damage to another country, the, the transboundary damage. It's sort of like international environmental law. When we talk about a, uh, a coal smelter uh, with fumes crossing the border or something to that effect, uh, those are situations where it may well be that a country can be found responsible for an internationally wrongful act and that that would lead to compensation. Obviously, it's hugely complicated in the COVID context. I think there are a lot of ifs in these hypotheticals, whether it's criminal or it's civil, uh, that I'm certainly not persuaded have been established. Um, and you know, when we're talking about a virus that uh, has spanned the entire globe, uh, infecting as many as it has, uh, the prospect of proving that somebody intended that, you know, on the criminal side is rather difficult. Proving that it should have been known when you're operating this virus in a lab that it could lead to these consequences, that's also a pretty tough thing to establish. Um, but in theory, I suppose it's possible. It's just we've never seen anything like that before in international law. So it seems like a difficult uh, path to go down. Thank you, Professor. I have another hypothetical question, if I may pose. Um, I, uh, there are many conventions which uh, which deal uh, with uh, uh, degrade uh, in human treatment, uh, and many uh, like war uh, conventions like on torture, genocide, as you had rightly pointed out. So, if uh, now if there is a convention. Uh, you know the the draft of the convention on uh, on crime against humanity has been approved and if um, uh, we may say that uh, rohingya uh, now rohingya matter is under the uh, convention of uh, genocide right so uh, if uh, the convention of crime against humanity also has, is introduced then under which uh, convention rohingya matter uh, rohingya case would be applicable so it would be possible i think uh, to pursue um the issue of the treatment of the Rohingya under both the Genocide Convention and the Crimes Against Humanity Convention. Uh, there's no, or, and possibly the Torture Convention and, and maybe others too. The, there's no ex exclusivity here, right? In the same way that when you prosecute someone in a national court, you may charge them with several different types of crimes. Um, there's no reason why that can't be true in terms of these international treaties as well. I would note, however, that one of the huge benefits of a Crimes Against Humanity Convention is that it's very difficult to prove genocide. You know, when you look at the elements required within the Genocide Convention, it's a very high standard of establishing a specific intent to destroy in whole or in part a particular peoples, that's gonna be very hard to prove as compared with crimes against humanity where you don't have to prove that you're trying to destroy a particular group of people. You do have to prove that you intended to attack the civilian population, but that's it, that just attacking civilians is enough. Um, so, you know, my concern uh, with some of the types of cases we've seen at the International Court of Justice, for example, is that ultimately Bosnia could not prove genocide against Serbia. And we'll see if Gambia can prove genocide against Myanmar. It's not obvious that they'll be able to do so, but if there were crimes against humanity convention, uh, with that lower standard, I think you'd, you'd stand a much better chance of it. Um, so I think that is one of the real advantages of trying to do a Crimes Against Humanity Convention. It gives you more options and it gives you a more viable option, I think. Thank you, Professor. My pleasure. Uh, Professor Murphy, I realize this is a very busy day for you and a very momentous day for you. I cannot thank you enough for taking our time 
and especially Ankit's effort to get us uh, to bring us an opportunity to interact with you. I think we'd be really looking forward to when times are better to host you on our campus. Uh, a lot of us, like the new joinees, have to visit it as well. So you we are really excited and we're really looking forward to another opportunity to interact with you. Thank you so much for the enlightening lecture and also keeping up to keeping us up to speed with, uh, you know, important global movements towards, uh, let's say, a better future. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. It was a great pleasure to be here with you. I was honored to be invited and I was delighted I could uh, join you. And I will certainly take you up on that offer to, to do an in-person visit when, uh, when the chance uh, arises. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you so much, sir. Grateful, obliged. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Me. Have a good day. Bye-bye now. See you too, Professor. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.